Southwest, we're going to have one of the best views of the big land and meteor storm in the world because it's going to be completely dark here when the storm is at its height. The main event is due to happen about 3 a.m. on November 18th, and it promises to be a spectacular show. The Leonid meteors come from a comet named Temple Tuttle that orbits the sun every 33 years. When the Earth passes through the streams of rock fragments that come from the comet, they burn up, leaving fiery trails, a great natural fireworks display. The Leonids pose no threat to us, but there are objects in our solar system that could wipe out all life on Earth. It's all a question of size. Siberia, 1908. 2,000 square miles of devastation was caused by a giant meteor strike, more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. The orbits of comets shift as they lose material when they come close to the sun. Meteors that come from them can be used to track the comet's path. And that's where these men come in. Steve Evans and Andrew Elliott are astronomers from the UK who specialize in the study of meteors. They are part of a huge international effort to map the orbits of near-Earth objects, a project that may well save humanity from the fate of the dinosaurs. But there is something that distinguishes the two British scientists. They are amateurs. Steve Evans sells computer components, and Andrew Elliott is a vet. But alongside their professions, they're also top astronomers in their field, natural meteor chasers. We have been studying the universe for thousands of years. Our knowledge is vast, but there is so much more to know. The resources of full-time paid astronomers are stretched to the limit. Fortunately, there is another cohort of scientists who shoulder a great part of the burden, gifted amateur astronomers. One of the greatest concentrations of this part-time talent is in Britain. In astronomy, there's a certain uh, branch of the subject where the amateurs play an important role because what they are doing is scanning the whole sky every night. And so what has often happened is that it's been the amateurs who have been the first to draw attention to a particular exploding star or comet, etc. Amateurs now with fairly modest sized telescopes and in particular with CCD cameras are able to make observations which are of professional quality. The great thing about the amateurs is that the large numbers of them Frequently, what we really need in astronomy is a lot of data being brought to bear on a particular field in order to make progress. It doesn't matter who collects the data, amateur or professional, so long as it's accurate. And that knowledge could one day lead us to the stars or prevent the extinction of humanity. I think astronomy is one of the few sciences, if not the only science left, that ordinary people without really expensive equipment or without huge amounts of knowledge can actually make real contributions to science. Um, uh, something that you couldn't do if you, in, in nuclear physics for example, I'm sure that's, it's not possible for amateurs to be involved. Not all astronomy has to be done with huge telescopes on the tops of mountains. Steve works from his back garden, and yet he is a leading light in a pan-European meteor tracking programme with Dutch amateurs and Czech professionals. All the meteors that we see in the night sky are originally derived from comets. At certain times of the year, the Earth uh, encounters um, the debris which has been laid down fairly recently by a comet, what we term a meteor stream. The information that we can derive from the orbits of the meteors can give us an understanding of the evolution of the meteor stream but it can also give us clues as to what's going to happen with the stream in the future. There's two main pieces of equipment. The first component is the actual image intensifier itself, uh, which amplifies any available light. This one actually amplifies the available light by 50,000 times. We put a lens on front of the intensifier to form an image on the front screen, and then to actually record the image on the rear screen, we use a standard Hi8 camcorder. I'm working in collaboration with another amateur and effectively what we're doing is we're um, recording or monitoring the same part of the sky and hopefully that we'll record the meteors actually simultaneously from two locations on the Earth's surface. Steve and Andrew use photographs as well as video. 
This is basically a meteor camera. It uses two photographic cameras, which will take pictures through a night, about four or five minutes duration. The rotating shutter breaks up the trail of the meteor as it passes through, so that you're able to get an estimate of the speed of the meteor through it. Using simple equipment, Andrew and Steve can record very clean and accurate images of meteors striking the atmosphere. The video data gives them an accurate time of appearance, and the photographs, clear against the streaks of the star field, tell them the position of the meteor in the sky. The breaks in the trail give them the speed, and Steve uses these three elements to compute the orbit of each meteor. There's actually the segment of the meteor and the start of the meteor break, and I'm going to measure that. And you can see the meteor starts to get brighter, that the segments become more readily visible. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm actually measuring the end of every break. The software um, carries out the calculations, and you can see that there's lots of calculations involved. But right at the bottom, it gives us the information that we're really interested in, which is the radiant and the orbital elements of the meteor. The data Steve and Andrew gather is sent to their professional colleagues at the Andreov Observatory in the Czech Republic. They use it to map the orbits of asteroids and comets. But the whole team has come to Albuquerque, New Mexico, to track the Leonids. Funds are limited, so transport and accommodation has to come at a reasonable price, but still have enough room for eight people and a lot of equipment. OK. Uh, well, the same? Uh, they're a little different inside, but they're basically the same inside. Was, it very, was there a huge difference? I think it's about six hundred and something dollars, and there's about I think on towards a thousand for the, the biggest one. The team has arranged observing sites within a few kilometres of their base in Albuquerque, but the weather has turned against them. Heavy clouds will prevent any sight of the Leonid meteors. The team has to find clear skies and quickly, but no one can agree on where they might be. But there is not so uh, good forecast for southwest. It's better to go to west. But we've got to go southwest. We've got to die, haven't we? And then we're going to be really struggling to make the time now. Silver City is too close to, uh, to do close the, to the US Mexican border. border. No. Oh, well, I don't care about this border. If, if we, but can, we, ha we have no chance to go to the south because there is border. Let's suppose the possibility to have one station here and one station there. No, it's too close. Too close. What's this distance? It's vital that they find somewhere to observe from because this will be the last chance to see the peak of the Leonids in ideal conditions for 66 years. I think this is a nice goal for today. Finally, a decision. They'll head west to Arizona but to escape the cloud front, they have to travel at least 400 kilometers. There's no guarantee that the weather will be any better or that they will find a site to observe from, but it's their only hope of seeing the Leonids. Steve and Andrew are interested in near-Earth objects, but most UK amateurs, like their professional colleagues, are particularly active in the exploration of deep space. One of the leading observational astronomers in the UK is Dennis Buzinski, a butcher in the north of England. His astronomical career started when he went to look for a bright comet that was predicted to be visible in the western sky. I went to look for it, but I never saw it. And uh, there was quite a few people there at the time as well, and I'd borrowed a small telescope from a friend. I was able to uh, have a look at a couple of the planets and just went to the library and started reading everything I could, you know. And just went from being an interest to an hobby, to being an obsession after that, you know. So you know, that's how I started with it, 1974. I joined the British Astronomical Association, the, the National Association, and became involved with uh, some of their observing sections. And it was only really when I found that you were able to do work which was possibly useful to say, you know, professional scientists that I took it really seriously to them. With a team of friends, Dennis has built a 33-centimetre telescope in his garden. When he started, like all other astronomers, Dennis used conventional photography. But advancing technology has transformed his work. All of astronomy depends on advanced technology. And the most important 
development in the last 20 years, perhaps, apart from the availability of space techniques, has been the replacement of photographic plates by charge couple devices. These are solid state chips that are very sensitive to faint light. This allows telescopes to detect faint light a hundred times more efficiently. And this means, of course, that uh, not only can the professionals with big telescopes do a hundred times better, but the amateurs with a 10-inch telescope can do the kind of things that required a really large telescope in the photographic era. The relative brightness of stars as we see them from Earth is expressed by their magnitude figure. The higher the number, the fainter the star. But they can be brighter or dimmer depending on their intensity or how far from Earth they are. So astronomers have to be expert in distinguishing the true nature of the stars they observe. When we look at stars with this type of telescope, we're generally looking at very faint objects that are impossible to see with the naked eye. In fact, even if you looked through the telescope with your eye, you still wouldn't probably be able to see them. We would need this, the electronic detector to see them. They're very, very faint objects, but they're very important objects as well. The famous Mount Palomar telescope, largest in the world when it was completed in 1948, conducted a complete survey of the stars down to magnitude 20. All stellar data and discoveries are measured against it. Now, amateurs like Denis Buzinski are making it obsolete with their home-built telescopes. For people like Denis, this means that they are able to look hundreds of millions of light years into the universe and do science that would previously have been the preserve of professionals. There are some types of stars which are variable. They pulsate or they explode. We also find a large fraction of stars are in binary systems. There are pairs of stars orbiting around each other. And you see variations in their light if one of them, for instance, eclipses the other during its orbit. You infer things about the stars, like how heavy they are, which you can't infer if you see them singly. And the volume of data that is involved in these studies is colossal. It's particularly suited to amateurs to do because they've got a, they're not restricted by time. They don't have to apply for telescope time. They've got their own telescope in their own observatory. And we can set up on a star and stop on it all night long. British amateurs have been studying and recording data on variables since the formation of the British Astronomical Association in 1890. And people like Dennis are carrying on that vital work on every clear night. We would go and find this star in this list of stars here, which are bright stars, and then we will set the position of the telescope, and then the telescope will slew to that particular position. We will then take images, and these images look like this. And this particular star is WZ Sagittarius, and it's a very famous cataclysmic variable and it's only been seen in eruption four times since it was first discovered. Now cataclysmic variables can vary in brightness over a period of a couple of hours from the faintest to the brightest but then they take a few months to disappear back down to the faintest levels and so these changes will measure over a period of a couple of months and uh, send it off to the professionals. Back in the desert, the meteor chasers have crossed into Arizona and found clear skies. But it has taken hours to escape the clouds and they are well behind schedule. By midday, they managed to identify one site at a campground just outside the town of Holbrook. You're going to work on UT or like Yeah, let's operate it on UT. UT, so minus seven then, so it's a um, five. I don't need it exactly, I'll take the GPS. Okay. They are here to check on the predictions of two professional astronomers, David Asher and Rob McNaught, who say that the peak of Leonard activity will occur at 3 a.m. on the 18th. That's still 40 hours away. But tonight they have to make sure that all their sensitive equipment is operating properly. If it fails, the whole trip will be wasted. The Czech team, accompanied by Steve Evans, head north for at least 100 kilometers to find a site for a second observing point. 
Andrew Elliott is part of the Southern team. This is what proper astronomers do. Uh, to come out here and do this, you really go back to basics, uh, having to actually go out and look at the sky and uh, all this equipment to set up, which is quite a professional setup and it's got to be done properly. Um, and it can take a lot out of you. When you have a shower like this, um, you observe right through the night, through to the early hours, and then roll into bed about six o'clock in the morning and uh, hopefully get some sleep. There are hundreds of men and women in Britain engaged in serious astronomy. Most use CCD technology, but some, like Hazel McGee, prefer more traditional methods. I'm a visual observer. I am observing variable stars. Quite often, I can look in my um, telescope and see just a blank piece of sky in the field for night after night, and then suddenly I'll look in a telescope and there is a bright star in the field and of course the field looks completely different, the pattern of the stars looks completely different. And if it's something that I was expecting I feel very satisfied and if it's something I wasn't expecting I feel even more satisfied, that's quite exciting. <laughs> Hazel has been observing for nearly 10 years. She and the dedicated amateur scientists like her acquire an enormous amount of data. But to have real meaning that information has to be shared with astronomers around the world. Guy Hurst, president of the BAA, who recently retired from his work with the bank, runs the Astronomer magazine, the Amateur's Bible. So the way the system really works is that TA collates the monthly observations. We publish them within 20 days of the last date that they were made. They are in a very raw form, but the professionals regularly monitor this magazine. They sometimes want urgent information because they're planning a programme themselves. So in that respect, rapid publication serves a very useful uh, relationship between professional and amateur. Well, what's happened is the professional astronomers now have moved into X-rays, infrared, ultraviolet. And as these gaps have been left behind, the improvement in technology has enabled the amateurs to step into those areas, which still need doing. We need regular monitoring. I mean, the, the classic is the asteroid thing where everybody's agreed throughout the world that we need to track and find new asteroids, particularly any that might threaten us, and follow them long enough to actually predict where they're going to go. And amateurs are doing that as well now. After three hours driving and frantic searching, the northern team finds an ideal spot. It's called Antelope Mesa, 1,700 metres above sea level and far from any light pollution. You can uh, set Hans' cameras on yeah. the cover. On the covers. On yeah. the covers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like that. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, like that. Zot can. Jo, dobře. Potřebujeme těch 50 metrů kabel natáhnout. Řekni, že pojedu s autem, hej. What's he doing with the van? He's bringing it closer. Uh, not uh, because of the Antelope Mesa is perfect for observing, but it's taken too long to find it. It's 5 o'clock and the sun has dipped below the horizon. In 20 minutes it will be dark and they still have to set up and test all of the experiments. If they miss this opportunity, there won't be another. The pressure is beginning to tell. I'll, I'll tell you what, I haven't had as much fun as when I had my wisdom tooth taken out. It is a measure of the dedication of these part-time scientists that they have paid their own way to come here. All the money for flights, the camper van hire, the transport of equipment, the equipment itself, comes out of their own pockets. Ah. Ah. Part-time or professional, astronomers receive little recognition for their work. But sometimes an individual achieves something that gets their name in the history books. Mark Armstrong is part of the foremost UK supernova patrol. Up to 1996, no UK astronomer, professional or amateur, had found a supernova. Mark discovered the first. But why are supernovae so important? Supernovae are massive explosion of a massive star. Astronomers know 
from studying many examples of these that the intrinsic brightness, the intrinsic luminosity of these type 1 supernovae are all the same. So if their intrinsic brightnesses are the same, then you can work out how far away they are. Just the same as when we're looking out at night at the, the street lamps. We know street lamps are all roughly the same. The ones that are more distant appear fainter than the ones that happen to be at the end of your, your driveway. And so in exactly the same way, astronomers can work out how far away these supernovae are. It's important to find as many supernovae as possible in as faint galaxies as possible, seeing further and further back in time and learning more about the universe. Mark built his own observatory, and over the years he has equipped it with some of the best telescope and camera technology available. This is a 12-inch mid cassegrain telescope. Uh, it's very simple to operate. It's a question of um, just telling the telescope at the beginning of the night uh, what star it's pointing at. And uh, then what I do after that is the computer takes over, but alternatively you can use the handset to go to any object which is currently in the sky. It's a question of looking uh, as many galaxies as you can, as often as you can. So a typical November night would be starting at, say, 7 o'clock uh, and finishing at quarter to 6. On this computer, you'd have the image which has just come down. On this one here, you display your best image that you've taken in the past, a reference image, if you like. And it's just a question, then, of looking at the two. Hopefully, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll have an extra point of light, uh, which will be uh, a possible supernova. Since his first discovery, Mark has found over 30 supernovae. But one of his most important discoveries came in May 2001. Just a typical observing night. and. Uh, this is just one of the, the galaxies in the program, and I, I noticed a, a very faint new object. It was only on some of the images, but I was confident enough that there was something there. And in the end, it took the intervention of the professional astronomers on the Palma to get the image for me. But the resolution of the one metre telescope comes into play here. But it turned out that it was a core collapse supernova, a um, massive star, but a low energy event, which is a new object type, so a useful object. So. Everyone was, you know, the professional astronomers were very pleased that I followed it through and there's going to be a paper on it. It's past midnight. Time to test the equipment. The cameras and videos are fired up. But not everything on Antelope Mesa is running smoothly. The synchronising system on the cameras has gone haywire. Is, is, is there a power? As soon as it gets plugged in, it's making an exposure, and it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. See though? Why is it doing that? Things are going badly at the southern base as well. Their generator has broken down. Thankfully, the peak of activity is expected tomorrow night. The Leonid meteors are very close in astronomical terms. But there are amateurs in the UK who are part of a project which involves the study of gigantic and mysterious explosions of gamma radiation at the edge of the universe. These gamma ray bursts are actually coming to us from, the light is coming to us from far away across the universe. It's taken many billions of years even to reach the Earth but the implication of that is that these are really enormous explosions. The, the amount of uh, radiation, the power that we're talking about is far larger than any previous phenomena that have been studied in the universe. Several gamma ray detection satellites have been launched, but there is no way of knowing where in the sky the bursts will turn up and who on Earth will be best placed to monitor them. The satellites detect the gamma rays and the most modern ones provide positions within a matter of seconds that now fairly automatically goes out over the internet to follow up observers and any of them that are then able to do so can then go off out and make observations straight away within minutes of the burst going off. Amateurs are ideally placed to do this observing. Guy Hurst runs the international network of amateur astronomers outside North America. So the problem for amateurs really is, can they react fast enough? Obviously, if it's daylight in your part of the world, you can't do it. Um, but by using an international team, then it, it is possible that somebody in the dark area of the sky can get out there and make the observations. 
And for that reason, NASA invited us over to Huntsville last year in Alabama to get together with a lot of other countries and form a team. Chaplin Finland managed to image one. And I think that fired everybody up. The fact that one amateur does it always means that it helps the rest of them to respond quickly and they're convinced they can do it too. In the Arizona desert, it's just past midnight on November the 18th. The peak of the Leonard meteor shower is due in about three hours. Things can still go wrong. The weather might close in again. The equipment could fail again. The predictions about the arrival of the meteors could be proved wrong. But to these meteor chasers, it's worth all the effort and sacrifice. This year is going to be the last opportunity that we'll have to see a Leonid storm under dark skies until under dark skies until 2099. Now, with the best will in the world, I don't think that I'm, our father might be around in 2099, but I don't think I'm going to be here. So I had to, whatever the difficulties, I just had to be here to see this. At about three in the morning, as predicted by Asher and McNaught, the peak of the Leonid meteor storm arrived. Oh, there goes one now. They hoped for a few hundred meteors an hour, but 2,000, perhaps more, streaked across the sky. It will take two years to analyze the data collected tonight. We've certainly been delighted what we've seen, and uh, everyone that's around here has been whooping with joy at all the uh, meteors and the odd, uh, very bright ones we've seen. So it certainly makes it all worthwhile, yeah. When you've been a meteor observer and you go outside uh, cold morning, February, March time, and there aren't any meteors about, and you think, what, two, maybe one, two meteors an hour, to see 2,000 meteors an hour, absolutely fantastic, and it's something that's a, uh, uh, it's as good as sex, almost. <laughs>